let's go start. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, Brian Roberts today. Uh, Brian is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy, Logic, and Scientific Method at the London School of Economics. Normally, except right now, he's actually uh, he's won a letter home prize, which allowed him to spend a year in uh, Dubrovnik at the Inter-University Center Dubrovnik to do research. Uh, his research is mostly concerned with philosophy of physics, some history of physics, some general philosophy of science, I suppose. And there's uh, sort of thematically, at least as I know, two things which dominate uh, Brian's research. One is uh, what we will hear about today. Time reversal is a, a, a big topic, uh, a topic on which he's writing or finishing a book that will come out soon, I hope. And the other one is um, observability or observable, the physics, physics and, and the observable, which will be sort of a, a starting project which will uh, occupy you more in the future. Uh, before going to LSE, Brian was a postdoc at the University of Southern California. And before then, he was a PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science working with uh, uh, very similar people as I did uh, some time ago. Uh, John Ehrman and John Norton were his PhD advisors. And before then, he studied uh, mathematics and philosophy at the University of Washington. So today, we will hear a more formal talk. Um, uh, he will be talking for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A. Tomorrow, we'll have the more informal uh, and disruptive, I suppose, seminar. Uh, today, he will be talking about time reversal. Please, Brian. Wow, Chris, thank you for the amazing introduction. That's lovely. Uh, also, it's only formal in the sense that it's a formal talk. You can, but I don't know. You can interrupt all you want, and it's not going to be too technical, this talk. Tomorrow's talk is much more technical. Uh, so this talks about the difference between the past and the future. And it's an old thought. This isn't something that we recently started thinking about. Aristotle worries about uh, proteron and histeron, the before and the after, and what, what that means, where they come from. Uh, and the basic thought is that there's at least a couple of different kinds of facts about time. One of the facts about time is how things are ordered. So you have a king that's crowned and a king that's killed, and some stuff in between, a war. <laughs> Uh, but there's, the intuition is there's this other kind of fact, besides just the order of things, which is the directedness of time. So you proceed from, you know, things are ordered as they are, but also there's an arrow. Uh, so things go from here to there. Uh, in the philosophy of time, there's all kinds of discussions about how exactly that arrow works. That arrow is sort of assumed or... Uh, or discussed in lots of different contexts, but one is in the discussion of what the past, present, and future are uh, in the so-called moving present perspective of time. You have, uh, you have all the events in time, all the possible things that can happen, and then there's this special thing about it that sometimes it's present, and that present is sort of shifting. So previously a breakfast was present, but now the current talk is present, so the present sort of shifts. And to be able to say this sort of thing, you have to know what direction the thing's flowing. You know, is it headed in this direction or that? So there's some directedness to time in this area of philosophy of time. Uh, there's a big discussion about so-called presentism, uh, in which you're asking which aspects of time are real. And many people have a strong intuition that the past isn't real, it's gone. You know, you can't go back and change that. And the future isn't real either, because it hasn't happened yet. And those people will then sometimes assert that well, the present, that's real. You're experiencing it right now. That's the real deal. Uh, some other people say things like this growing block perspective. They think that the past is real. It's settled. That stuff really happens. You know, the war in 66 or something. Uh, but, only the, but the future is open. So the future is not real yet. We haven't made it reality yet. Uh, and you're sort of adding new pancakes on top of this block uh, in each new present moment as the, as the talk proceeds, for example new moments are coming into reality. Uh, and both of these perspectives, interestingly, require a direction of time. They don't discuss it so much in this literature, but the literature requires really some directedness to time. So it's a kind of fact, the direction of time. 
uh, on both of these perspectives. Uh, not everybody thinks that. Um, a curious thing in physics is that you rarely see uh, the direction of time uh, appearing in the sort of foundations of the field. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the talk. Um, but this has led some people to suggest that maybe that, certainly it's rare in physics to see anything like the passage of time, the discussion of the present or the past or the future. We use that in everyday language all the time. But in physics, we'll talk about different events and how you go from one event to the other. It's just rare to talk about the present event or the future event in physics. So uh, Norton grappled with this a little bit, uh, this idea that, well, if physics doesn't talk about this, you know, what, what is this passage? Uh, some people have suggested that it's just an illusion. Humans experience something like the passage of time, but it's not an objective fact. And Norton thought that, you know, although it's tempting at first to say that, he thought that, uh, well, we should be careful. He said, if the passage of time is an illusion, it's quite unlike these familiar examples of illusions. He goes through a bunch of optical illusions uh, in space. And he says that the passage of time carries none of these distinguishing marks that enable us to identify other illusions. So this is in an article John wrote called uh, Time Really Passes. Uh, so just as like a fun warm up, I just find this interesting, the question of whether or not the passage and the directedness of time might be an illusion. So here's a video of a, a rotating, rotating thing, a bunch of bicyclists going around in a circle. And here is uh, the same film being wound in reverse. We'll talk about this more. This is what I'll call an example of what I'll call a time reverse of this system. So here's the forward direction of time. Here's the backwards direction of time. And one thing you notice about it is that for rotating things, they go in the opposite direction. I'm literally just winding the film in reverse. And you see that a thing that rotates counterclockwise from above is now rotating clockwise from above uh, in, the, in the time reversed image. So, and then there are these illusions of rotation that you may have seen. This is a really famous one called the spinning dancer. Uh, some of you will see the spinning dancer as spinning clockwise from above. Raise your hand if you see it that way. Okay. Three people. Some of you will see it the opposite. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're okay. Everybody else sees it the opposite. Okay, and you saw it switch. <laughs> yeah, you sometimes see it switch. It's a really strange illusion. Uh, that's an example in which it's not clear which direction the thing's rotating, but the same holds. If it's rotating clockwise, the time reverse, you know, the backwards in time motion, is the thing rotating in the opposite direction. So you could, if you like, perhaps view this as an illusion about time order. It's not clear which time order this thing has. Uh, so there's some interesting philosophy in here. Uh, it's related to a quite general question, is there a true direction of time or is it just a human phenomenon that we perceive the future is different from the past? We remember our breakfast, but we don't remember the dinner that we're about to have. Uh, but is that more than a human thing or is it a fact about reality that there's one true direction of time? So this is an old philosophical question. There's some new discussion about it. Uh, we're going to focus today uh, in particular on, on uh, what physics says about the direction of time. So let me now turn to physicists a little bit. Um, that's the philosopher's take. The physicist's take on the direction of time, as best I can tell, people didn't think about it that much in physics, Pache Aristotle, uh, until the 19th century, really, when people started making engines. And when you're making an engine, uh, you have this, you know, the general idea is you have some kind of explosion and that leads to an expansion that pushes a wheel to turn. And you want it to do that again and again and again and again so that the wheel keeps turning. You need to keep exploding and keep expanding and so on. So you need to be able to repeat a process. And in order to study that, one easy thing to imagine is that the process goes back to where it started. So it's a cycle. It starts with an explosion, there's an expansion, and then it goes back to the original state. Uh, and that discussion uh, came out of the work of Carnot uh, in the early study of thermodynamics. And people started to use this word, physical reversibility. We started to talk about a reversible process. Uh, physicists weren't so much in this moment imagining time is really going in the opposite direction. They were just imagining how do you put things back to how they, how they started, like when you clean your room or something. But once you started thinking in this way, it turned out to be a really powerful tool. So you notice that some processes uh, were naturally reversed, some processes didn't reverse so naturally. So this is an example of a 
physical irreversibility. You know, you have a cigarette burning and smoke sort of going out into the room. And you can imagine uh, the reverse process in which the smoke sort of goes back into the cigarette and it unburns. <laughs> but you never see that, really. Or at least it must be very, 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 very rare. Uh, so this is maybe the first indication that not only is there an interesting notion of rever reversibility in time, but maybe there's some special directedness to time. Uh, just thinking about thermodynamics and the, really in the beginning, just engines. And then there was this curious observation that most physical processes, if they can happen in one direction in time, they can happen in the other direction, once you're looking at this sort of level of particles and mechanical things. So if I've got a ball that can roll, this is, this is in effect uh, a ball that starts at rest, it starts rolling down, and then the time reverse of that, it's a, sort of the same video wound in reverse, so you see the reverse thing. The ball rolls back up to the top and comes to a rest just at the top. Uh, a curiosity between this image and this one is that although this is irreversible, people also think that these cigarettes are made up of particles, ultimately, that look a lot like this and are subject to forces similar to this particle, like gravity and electromagnetism. And those forces all seem to have this kind of symmetry, that if they can happen in one way, they can happen in the other way too. So this is called the Loeschmidt paradox, pointed out by the chemist Joseph Loeschmidt, uh, that you have some irreversibility here, you have some reversibility here at the level of the fundamental particles, and it's not clear how that's possible if this reverses to that. And of course, there's a discussion in the philosophy of uh, thermal physics and statistical physics about how this, <coughs> how this happens. There's some disagreement about that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much. Um, but I just want to identify, this is sort of how physicists came to talk about time reversal in the beginning uh, and the direction of time. Now, through the 1950s, uh, it seemed that all the fundamental forces, once we started talking about particles like these, uh, all the fundamental forces are time reversal symmetric. So for now, we'll talk about that more, but for now, uh, just imagine that if the video can happen in one direction, it can happen in the reverse direction as well. Uh, and then there was this shocking discovery uh, in 1964, which led to the 1980 Nobel Prize. Uh, these are two physicists, Cronin and Fitch, uh, who discovered that there's at least one fundamental force, which is called the weak force uh, in the standard model of particle physics, uh, which has a time asymmetry built into it. Uh, it can only have, there's, there are processes that only happen in one direction, not in the other. Uh, and they write, th this is in the uh, Nobel Prize press release about them, it says, all attempts have been unsuccessful to avoid such a radically new conclusion as that which says that perfect symmetry by time reversal is not always true. So time reversal symmetry fails, there's a special preferred direction of time for these forces. I'm going to talk about this in technical detail uh, in the seminar tomorrow, and some of the puzzles about this, how it is we come to learn these sorts of things, how this experiment worked, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, there's lots of nice philosophy of physics in this. Um, but right now I just want to, want to point out that uh, this is an issue that has interesting philosophical significance. It has really interesting physical relevance as well. Um, one is for this under well, uh, understanding of the direction of time that won a Nobel Prize. Uh, some other things that time reversal is relevant for. Uh, it matters for this thing called magnetic susceptibility. You can use time reversal to figure out how magnetizable a salt is. Uh, that's to do with a phenomenon called Kramer's degeneracy, you sometimes see in quantum mechanics courses. Uh, and Wigner showed that this is deeply related to the phenomenon of time reversal. Uh, it's used to explain why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe. Uh, this is to do with uh, a theorem in physics called the CPT theorem, and this idea of Sakharov about the early universe and its evolution. I'm going to talk about this more tomorrow as well, so I won't comment too much about it. Uh, but one of the big open puzzles in physics about the, the, the baryon asymmetry, uh, the, the difference between matter and antimatter in the universe, rests on issues to do with time reversal. Uh, time reversal places restrictions on what sorts of particle states can happen. Uh, this is called the super selection rule. And there's a boson fermion super selection rule. Certain particle entangled states between these kinds of particles can't happen. And that's to do with time reversal as well. That can be viewed as a consequence of the meaning of time reversal. And there's this funny theorem in the early 20th century uh, called Payne-Levé's theorem, sometimes called bad news for falling cats. 
uh, in which Payne LeVay argues on the basis of time reversal little symmetry that uh, cats shouldn't be able to always land on their feet. If the branch breaks and their feet are pointed up, they're always going to hit the ground on their back. So then it's, you know, he makes some assumptions for the, you know, that are false for that to work. We know the cats can land on their feet. Uh, but there was some early discussion with literal cats in the titles of these physics papers uh, that drew on time reversal invariance in the early 20th century. <laughs> so time reversal matters, philosophically and physically. That's sort of this warm-up discussion. Uh, there's a further question, though, about what it means uh, that uh, I want to take you through. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about for most of the talk today, what time reversal means and why we think it means one thing rather than another. And to help you see why this is just not such an easy question, if I'm talking about translating a thing in space, like moving it around space, I have this really convenient opportunity available to me that I can pick a thing up and move it over there and study what that means to me. I have an operational pick the thing up and move it technique for teaching myself about how things translate in space. Okay? Rotation is similar. If I want to rotate a thing, I can do it in space. I have an activity which tells me what it means. Even mirror symmetry, called parity, is something that we can sort of look at in a mirror and see how this image of the world looks through the mirror. Or if you wanted it in three dimensions, you could turn a bag inside out and see how things reverse under this, this uh, mirror symmetry. But when it comes to time reversal, you know, how do you do that? You know, you don't just like take a butterfly and you know time reverse its lifetime. There's not a way that we know of to do that. Okay, uh, time reversal is not a thing we can literally do. We don't turn around time. It sounds like sci-fi at first when you hear the word. And you can imagine an impassioned philosopher of physics. We were uh, discussing Tim Maudlin earlier. Bless his heart. You know, I can imagine him like pulling hair and saying, you know. What would it even mean to reverse time? You know, it's a powerful question. Uh, so, what I want to argue today is that you can understand that question. You can give meaning to time reversal, uh, and the way you do it is you explore, in particular cases, how things depend on time. And there's not just one easy thing I know how to say about what time reversal means. It really depends case by case on how particular facts from particular theories depend on time. So uh, I'll take you through some of that. Uh, we'll talk about what physicists say about time reversal now in s simple terms. Uh, we'll talk about sort of some competing accounts uh, by philosophers. Oh yeah, I wrote it here. Uh, so right here is time reversal in physics. Some competing accounts by some philosophers uh, will come next. That's uh, what I call the pancake objection to the standard physics account of time reversal. Uh, I'm going to give a critique of this. This account has been around for a while. Uh, it was discussed by Callender and Albert in the year 2000 in independent, independent written papers uh, and book. Uh, and it, uh, there's a small community of people who keep reviving it. Uh, so I wrote a sustained critique of the thing, which you can read on the, the article that's linked to the talk on the, on the, on the website for this talk. Uh, and much of this talk is going to be about that critique. I'm going to take you through that critique. Uh, and then at the end, I'm not going to spend lots and lots of time on this. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some alternative approaches on how to justify why physics treats time reversal in a certain way. I'm just going to sort of highlight it because it gets a little technical. Uh, and I don't want this talk to be too technical. But in questions period, if you like, we can, we can, we can talk about these in more detail. Okay. So how does physics think about time reversal now in more detail? We, we began by just showing images of films going forwards and backwards. So breaking it down a little bit more, uh, I want to represent moments in time in terms of these slicings, where I've got a moment in time. This could be 2 PM, 3 PM, 4 PM, 5 PM. Or I'm just going to number a number line over here, and this will represent time. And it's like a timer that starts at some negative number, and it's going up. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it carries on. So it's a timeline. Uh, and my butterfly animation begins at some moment with the caterpillar, and later it has the chrysalis, the chrysalis, and then the butterfly in, in a later moment. And on a first pass, the sort of thing you're going to need to do to talk about reversing time uh, in this sort of scenario is to turn around the order of events. So on a first pass, 
I ought to start with butterfly and then have chrysalis, chrysalis, and then end with caterpillar. Now, if I want to implement that on the timeline, what's the time reverse timeline going to look like? It's just going to be sort of turned around. So instead of starting with a negative number somewhere, I'll start with a positive number and go down. So instead of going negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, I'm starting over here with 2, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2. Uh, mathematically, what I've done is I've taken each number and I've sent it to its negative. So whatever time it is, I sent it to the negative at that time. And that has the effect of flipping this, this axis around. So mathematically and sort of physically thinking, this is how the standard account begins, by reversing the order of things. So let me just write that down. In physics, time reversal means what? Uh, well, the first thing it does is it reverses order. And we're going to write this mathematically this way by sending t to negative t. But there's some other stuff that has to happen. And you can see that immediately if you think about velocity. So now I've got a particle that moves across a plane. And I'm going to do the same sort of exercise. I'll think about how that particle moves across the plane at different moments in time. And an early moment is here. And, but it's moving to the right, so at a later moment it's in a further to the right position in space. And further to the right and further to the right. And when I time reverse this, okay, I've got the reverse order now. I've taken this top thing and I've put it here. So now it goes here and then there and then there and then there. So it's moving to the left. And you can see if you just look at it, I didn't have to draw this arrow. You've got a particle that starts here and is moving to the left. It's got velocity directed to the left. So something's happening to velocity too. I haven't just switched the order of events. I've transformed a property of this particle, which is its velocity. It went from being velocity pointed this way to now velocity pointed that way. Velocity to the right, velocity to the left. And you know, maybe I'm making this, sorry to drill the point too much, but you, know, you can see it anyway. This is the, the original motion, and the velocity is in that direction. The time reverse has the velocity in the opposite direction. Okay? That's what's being depicted here. So an observation about why this is. Velocity is a quantity. It's a property of the particle, if you like. Uh, but it's also a quantity that depends, for its very definition, on the direction of time. Uh, you, you could write velocity like this. It's change in distance over change in time. And that means that if I tinker with time a little bit here, it's going to tinker with the velocity. So imagine I've done what we said. I'm going to reverse time. And I do it the way I said we would. I'm sending time to its negative, like this that makes velocity go to its negative by its very definition. So this is sort of mathematically why velocity changes sign, why it changes when we time reverse a system on this picture. So OK, uh, in physics, time reversal means a couple of things now. We're going to reverse time order, but we're going to recognize that velocities depend on that time order. And so we're going to reverse, we're going to make sure we reverse them too. Uh, but there's some other things that physics says, which unfortunately, this is the most general way I know how to capture it. In physics, time reversal also means that you reverse anything else that depends appropriately on the direction of time. And you immediately ask, but Brian, what do you mean by depends? And what do you mean by appropriately? And direction and time, OK. <laughs> so you could ask you know, about all the words in this sentence. Uh, but this in particular is sort of left annoyingly vague, uh, reverse anything that depends appropriately on the direction of time. Uh, but I'll give you an example of one such thing. This is a picture of a magnetic field on the left here. Uh, so I've got a north pole and a south pole of this magnetic field. And magnetic, magnetic fields, uh, well, there's sort of tendencies for magnetizable things to, to be pushed around by magnetic forces. And uh, so when you have these lines like this, if you were to drop iron shavings on there, you'd see the iron shavings line up with the lines in a certain way. So this is a physical thing. Uh, I'll write B to denote this magnetic field. Uh, on the standard account of time reversal, how physicists understand time reversal, uh, now, I mean, sorry, notice this is not a thing, this is, it's not a thing that has a velocity, okay? Uh, there's no velocity built into this. It's a field. It's a property of space in various places. Uh, but physicists say when we reverse time by, for example, sending t to negative t, we should be sure to do another thing. We should be sure to appropriately reverse the magnetic field. Uh, so on the standard account of time reversal, the magnetic field changes its direction 
uh, on each of these lines. And we indicate that by saying B, the vector field B goes to negative B. Uh, so this is not a velocity. This is that extra additional thing that was thrown in under the umbrella. And there's a great number of things like this. Uh, the <coughs> game, time reversal says not just reverse order like this, but do all this other stuff. The wave function goes to the time reverse of the wave function. And the position representation is the conjugate. Spin goes to negative spin. QP goes to Q negative P in Hamiltonian mechanics. EB, that's an electric field and a magnetic field, goes to E negative B. Electric field stays the same, but not the magnetic field. So there's all this other stuff that's piled in to the meaning of time reversal, besides just reversing order and reversing velocities. But that's the standard account. So what I want to now say so far, again, revisiting the lesson, I'm going to keep adding stuff to this lesson, OK? So today's lesson is we can understand time reversal by exploring how things depend on time. Uh, so, so far, there's some puzzle about why magnetic fields reverse the way they do. Uh, we learned, though, that at least on the standard account, many properties reverse when time reverses and not just velocity. Some other stuff does, too. So you can see why this is a, a nice space for somebody to be worried about. This is, in my view, a nice example of the foundations of physics. You have a place where physicists are using a term, which is a, it's widely agreed this is an important idea, a time reversal, philosophically and physically. And it's not so clear, well, they have a standard definition for it, but uh, it's rare in textbooks to see a really clear argument. Why do we use this definition and not something else? And you can feel the way I presented it, I hope, that it's a little, it seems a little mysterious, you know? It seems a little vague. So it's a great opportunity for somebody in the foundations of physics to go in and clean some things up. I'll point out in this talk, too, there's lots of interesting open problems in this literature as well. So it's sort of, I think it's just cracking open right now, this topic. So OK, uh, the next bit of the talk is, is about an objection. Uh, if you didn't like the, the standard physics presentation of time reversal, you might object. Uh, and, and here's how some people have done it. So the complaining starts not even with philosophers. It starts with physicists. So here's Wigner, the very first book that mentions time reversal systematically in mechanics, uh, he asks whether time reversal deserves the name time reversal. And what he says is, uh, well, maybe he just suggests maybe a different word would be better. He says, uh, maybe reversal of the direction of motion is a more uh, felicitous, though longer expression than time inversion. Uh, in a more modern physics textbook, Sakurai says, this is a difficult topic for the novice, partly because the term Time reversal is a misnomer. It reminds us of science fiction. Actually, what we do in this section can be more appropriately characterized by the term reversal of motion. So the physicists are suggesting maybe that the word's not good. Here's another one, Valentine. The term time reversal is misleading, and the operation would be more accurately described as motion reversal. These are some of the most detailed comments you can find in textbooks about why time reversal is how it is. They just say, ah, oh, it's just motion. But again, it's hard, when you look at the magnetic field, this is, this is still not so helpful. The magnetic field is not by itself motion. So, you know, we need some help here still. So then in uh, 2000, some philosophers jumped into this topic. Uh, and I, I think independently, David Albert and Craig Callender started working on this topic. Uh, and Albert wrote in his book, the books, I guess all the books, or the textbooks that deal with time reversal, identify precisely that transformation as the transformation of time reversal. The thing is that this identification is wrong. Time reversal can involve nothing whatsoever other than reversing the velocities of the particles. So he doesn't like that all, others, all the other stuff that you do in time reversal besides reversing order and reversing velocities. And Craig Callender says a very similar thing. He says, David Albert argues, rightly in my opinion, uh, I think he makes some comments in his dissertation some years earlier about this as well. Uh, that the traditional definition of time reversal invariance, which I've just given, is in fact gibberish. It does not make sense to time reverse a truly instantaneous state of the system. Uh, more recently, uh, Elena Castellani and Janan Ishmael uh, say that time reversal should leave the states intrinsically untouched and just change their order. Now the context of this comment is they're complaining about another article I wrote about uh, Curie's principle, arguing that it's false. And I do this on the basis of the standard definition of time reversal. And their reaction is, 
get rid of that definition of time reversal. The standard one's bad. And so they, they're proposing to do that. They say get rid of the standard definition of time reversal and adopt this Albert calendar perspective. If we cleave to that understanding of time reversal, none of the counterexamples Roberts offers constitutes a failure of Curie's principle. So this is their response to the, that concern. And then uh, I just saw in Phil Say Archive uh, last week, or maybe even a few days ago, Valia Lori's nice new paper forthcoming in studies, uh, where she says, uh, if one accepts the standard definition of time reversal T, then one also has to accept that T is, T is able to change the ontology, change what kinds of things uh, can be, can exist, and how they exist. This, she says, is extremely strange, since it amounts to saying that the content of the state of the world could change depending on whether it comes from the forward or backward movie of the world. To me, that's sort of just saying it seems very, she finds it quite strange that the content of the world depends on the direction of time. So I want to address really this concern directly. Oops, sorry, that's my title, not hers. Uh, the world of one. Uh, I want to address this question really directly. Is it possible for properties to depend on the direction of time, and they're not just velocity? She finds it extremely strange. Maybe it's just a matter of taste, but I don't find it so strange. We'll see. So that's the pound Yeah. So here, here we're gonna now make give it a name. This thing. Uh, so the pancake objection, since the 2017 paper I have on this topic. It says things just lie there in time, like a pancake. Uh, there's a thread of this in all the quotes that I gave earlier. So let me say this now in a little more detail, the pancake objection. Time reversal only changes time order and velocities. So if I'm looking, like a magnetic, I'm looking at a magnetic field, it just lies there in space. Uh, it doesn't depend in any special way on the direction of time. So when I draw a picture like this, it doesn't matter if these particles have all kinds of interesting properties, colors, charges, electric and magnetic fields all around them. I am, I'm done describing time reversal when I change the order and I make sure I change the velocities of things. That's the total picture according to the, the pancake objection. And physicists went off the rails the moment they started throwing in all these other properties when they reversed time. So that's, that's the objection. And it's an alternative account of what it means to reverse time. Uh, good, sorry, I'm just saying it over and over again. Other instantaneous properties do not change under time reversal on this view. So no magnetic field changes, no spin changing, no wave function changing, none of that stuff. Just velocities, just order and time. Uh, some philosophical implications. Uh, one of the most radical ones is about this property called symmetry under time reversal. So I've mentioned this briefly a few times already. Uh, let me now say in a little more detail what I mean by symmetry under time reversal. Uh, for the experts, I'll give you a more precise definition in a second. But to begin, let's imagine a Pac-Man world. And what's special about a Pac-Man world is that you can only do certain things. Okay? There's like walls and way. But various things are possible. There are possible Pac-Man trajectories in the Pac-Man world. So physics is a lot like that. The laws of nature are a lot like that. They say certain things can happen, certain trajectories can happen, and other things can't. Okay? So let me use this definition of possibility. You could think of it as Pac-Man possibility if you like, but it's also the laws of nature. It's possible if the laws of nature allow it. Then a law is called time reversal symmetric, sometimes time reversal invariant. Uh, if the time reverse of every possible motion is also possible. Okay? The time reverse of every possible motion is also possible. So when I was imagining Pac-Man, I showed you a possible motion. Pac-Man started moving, he ate some pellets. And now I can take the time reverse of this by sort of winding the film in reverse. And I can ask, is that a possible motion? And well, it's true that Pac-Man can take that path, but he doesn't sort of barf out the, the pellets again. Once, you know, once they're gone, they're gone in this game. So that's actually not a possible motion, what he did there. So maybe you would say, this is a theory, this Pac-Man theory is one which is not time symmetric. I showed you a possible motion, but the time reverse is not possible. If I had taken all the pellets away, then maybe I would have a time symmetric Pac-Man, uh, because okay, the reverse motion looks like it's possible. 
A uh, non-silly example which you can't see due to bloque, but it doesn't matter so much. Does this mean? Autorisé. Autorisé, c'est où ça? It's on top so, right. Top right. Anyway, it doesn't. Uh, regular d'exception? No. You should close this. Yes, I should. And then it's further, further north. Top right. Oh, there. Autorisé. Oui. Toujours, s'il vous plaît. Merci. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, good. So what you do not see, <laughs> what you do not see in this image is a bouncing spring. So it's just meant to be a harmonic oscillator. Uh, you know, you can see it in a pendulum too. Here's another one. So this image is analogous to what I was going to show you. It's a swinging thing. In the absence of air, it keeps doing this forever. And uh, that swinging oscillator is sort of manifestly time symmetric. But well, you can think about this intuitively as, if I reverse a video of this, I see the exact same thing, right? If you just saw me standing very still here and you reverse the video, it'd be hard to tell that the video is going in reverse. So the possible motion also has a possible time reverse. That's an example of a time, time reversal symmetric system and the harmonic oscillator is therefore widely believed to be time symmetric. Um, but, oh, sorry, it looks like that went away, that slide. Oh, no, it didn't. I just pushed the wrong button. Uh, if one adopts the pancake account, there are no non-trivial time asymmetries. Uh, sorry, time symmetries, I should say. That's a typo. Sorry. If one adopts the pancake account, there are no non-trivial time symmetries. Everything is time asymmetric. Uh, that's a ma math fact to show it in total generality. So you can find it in this paper and that paper. Oh, and I've written the slides here, the link to the slides. And these are links, links. You can click on them and go to the papers if you go there. Uh, so uh, one curiosity about the pancake account is that whereas you might have thought that uh, the swinging pendulum were time symmetric, it's not on this account. It comes out time asymmetric. Some other consequences. Uh, Rutlinger and Farr have argued that there's a nice deflationary account of causation available if you uh, uh, adopt this pancake version of time reversal. Uh, Castellani and Ishmael, we discussed, proposed it as a way to save the symmetry principle called Curie's principle. Uh, Alori has used it a couple of times. She argued that electromagnetism is contradictory. <laughs> and then she recently argued, this, this is sort of one of the upshots of the paper, uh, for uh, a sort of wave function anti-realism on the basis of this, of this uh, view. So some people have been doing stuff with this. Um, but here's what I think. Uh, we can understand time reversal by exploring how things have been on time. The standard view says many properties reverse when time reverses, but and denying this, adopting the pancake perspective has some really undesirable consequences. So I want to talk about those now. So this is the trouble with pancakes. So it seems plausible at first, the pancake account. What, what are we doing reversing electric, you know, magnetic fields uh, when we reverse time? Why do we do that? Uh, but I want to, you know, Alori has this very, she says it's extremely strange. She has a powerful intuition that if uh, you have some facts in the world, they just lie there, and they shouldn't depend on the direction of time. That would be extremely strange, she says. Uh, I don't find it so strange, and I want to just give you an example as to, from everyday language about why this, it just doesn't seem so weird to me. Uh, so here's a soldier, and here's a vicious dragon, and the soldier's got a sword, and she's running. But this is sort of a, just a frame, okay? I've just shown you a picture and you're not getting to see the rest of the video. So you don't know right now which direction this person is moving in time, let's say, okay? I don't know if it's a film in which she's moving this way, or if it's the time reverse of that in which she's sort of backpedaling that way, okay? And I ask, is this soldier brave or cowardly? And you might want to think if she's running towards the dragon, she's brave or maybe stupid. And if she's running away from the dragon, that's like, either cowardly or smart. Uh, 
And that's a property which, well, you know, you, there's some philosophy to do about this. Where does the where does the bravery and the power lie? Is it like, in, is it a property of the person, or is it somehow the system as a whole? How do I deal with this property? But on a first pass, you know, it's a person who's brave, and uh, that property seems to depend on the direction of time. When I reverse the direction of time, I've got her going the other direction. She goes from brave to cowardly, or cowardly to brave. So on a first pass, this doesn't seem so weird to me. I mean, the idea is just that there might be properties besides velocity that matter for their definition what direction of time it is. Can such a thing happen? You know, Some things don't seem to be like that, like color. If it's red, it doesn't matter if the film is going forwards or in reverse. But might there be other properties which do depend on the direction of time? So that's now the question. And my perspective is it's a sort of a physical question. Uh, I, you know, I don't have such strong intuitions going into this. I want to look at the particular context. I want to examine how do these properties get defined. If I talk about a magnetic field, what is that? Where does it come from? And if I talk about bravery and cowardly, I have to think about what is that? Where does it come from? And then maybe I can detect if it depends for its definition on the direction of time. So I'm not so sure about the motivation. Uh, here's another way to put it. Properties can depend on orientation in space. When I first learned this, this was mind-blowing to me. I don't know how you guys feel about this. These two molecules taste totally different. And the only difference is that one is a spatial reflection of the other one. So these are chiral molecules. They have a certain you know, uh, chirality. They have a sort of orientation in space. And if you reverse that orientation, otherwise it's exactly the same structures, uh, but you get a totally different human experience. So on the one molecule, you taste caraway. And on the other molecule, you taste spearmint. So the property of flavor depends on orientation in space, weirdly. Why can't properties depend on orientation in time, too? Well, that's the proposal. Maybe the magnetic field is a property that depends on the direction of time. And we'll see towards the end that there's some, you can give reason for this, too. I mean, you can make an argument that you, by examining carefully where this magnetic field comes from, you, you, David Malamon has argued that it does depend on the direction of time and in exactly the way that physicists say it does. So concern number two, momentum in the wrong direction. I'm going to just give a few concerns here about this account. Uh, here is the original picture when we were thinking about the pancake account and we said by reversing the order of time, we reverse the velocities. But velocity is not the same thing as momentum. Uh, when you first learn about momentum, you learn that momentum is mass times velocity. So if I reverse velocity, then I'm also going to reverse momentum, uh, as long as I'm not reversing mass. That's actually an interesting open question. How does mass behave under time reversal? Uh, so, but okay, but not, it's not always like this. In general, in the most general context, momentum is a property of a state of the world. Uh, and in, a, in the general approach to mechanics that is Hamiltonian mechanics, you just have this big manifold, a big, could be a plane in two dimensions, where each point represents a possible state of the world. And the coordinates of that state are Q and P. And sometimes they're interpreted as Q is position and P is momentum, with momentum also defined like this. But it's not always the case. And in fact, in general, in electromagnetism, this is not true. Momentum is not equal to mass times velocity. There's a uh, 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 vector potential term that appears on the side. Uh, so uh, momentum is not just vo reversing velocity. It doesn't automatically reverse, when, especially if I look, for example, at this particular theory, the general theory of mechanics and Hamiltonian mechanics. Uh, so just by turning around time in Hamiltonian mechanics or in quantum mechanics or in most mechanical theories, uh, I won't turn around momentum. And that leads to a weird result where when I'm describing a particle moving one direction, I apply the pancake account of time reversal, and I get velocity in the appropriate direction, but momentum is still pointed in that direction. Because they say, if it's not velocity, it doesn't change. Uh, this is, again, the harmonic oscillator that you uh, can't see, but I will, again, uh, move this spin for you to be reminded about a harmonic oscillator. <laughs> uh, 
Here's the phase space diagram. Sorry, brief technical interlude for people who know what that is. You're describing the position and the momentum of a thing. And if it's a harmonic oscillator, this is the phase space diagram at different energy levels. It goes around and around. It means it goes to the right on position and then it goes to the left on position. And its velocity is directed to the right and then it's directed to the left and then the right and the left and that's something swinging back and forth in, in space. Uh, if I just apply the pancake account of time reversal, just t goes to negative t, and I don't change p and q, I get this funny thing where the motion, the velocity, is reversed. So if it was going right to left, now it's swinging left to right. But the momentum doesn't change. The momentum is always pointed in the wrong direction. And the normal thing that you do is then also reverse momentum. And it gives you the same phase space diagram. So you can see again manifestly why the system will, will end up being time reversal symmetric. It's the same thing here as it is there. So this is the full standard account of time reversal, and the pancake objection, the pancake account essentially stops at this strange middle ground. Uh, so I take this as a just strange feature of the count. You can just accept it. Uh, in personal conversation with some of these people, it's been suggested to me that that's not so bad. You just accept it. So. But I'm putting it out there as a strange property of this account now. You sometimes have momentum going in the wrong direction when you didn't expect it to. So we mentioned that there's no non-trivial temporal symmetries, no non-trivial time symmetries on this account. To me, that's really a drag. Uh, this was an amazing thing, this discovery in 1964 of a time asymmetric process at the level of fundamental physics. It won Nobel Prizes, and this was a really weird interaction. It's called a neutral k on interaction. You had a particular neutral k on state, which decayed into two pions. And uh, if you ever see this, this decay, uh, in the, in, it turns out to be CP violating, which is equivalent to T violating in quantum theory. So that means this, is always a, this turns out to always be a time asymmetric process when this happens. Uh, uh, we'll talk tomorrow about why that is. You can read that off in a really neat way uh, using Curie's principle, actually. Uh, so, and this was a lovely discovery, something interesting and weird and new. I call it time asymmetric. The example that you won't see on this video, oops, of a harmonic oscillator is just not so weird like that. It looks so time symmetric to me. I, I sure would like an account that manages to distinguish between this beautiful, interesting new thing and this totally banal oscillating uh, uh, pendulum. Uh, the pancake account can't do that because it says they're both time asymmetric and that's it. Or it would use another word, I suppose, to do it. So in my view, a more useful account of time reversal should distinguish between these cases. And the last concern, uh, it's not often mentioned. I'm not really sure what they would say to this. I'm really not sure how to respond to this from a pancaker. So if you guys like the pancake account, you can tell me what you think about this. Uh, the account itself is not well defined, really. Uh, here's why. How do we reverse temporal order in physics? I described it as this thing where, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got a bunch of slices of space, a bunch of moments in time, and so I've got them in order. And when I talked about reversing them, I talked about perfectly reversing them all evenly like this. Okay. They're in the reverse order. But I could have done it with these spread out a lot more, and these ones really close together, and this one way over here. Okay? This is the reverse order from the original, but I've sort of stretched out time in weird ways here and there. Okay? Uh, the standard account has a particular take on this that you don't do that. That's not the right way to time reversal. But the pancake account doesn't really say anything. They just say you're supposed to reverse the order and reverse the velocities, and they, I'm not really sure whether they think you should also do it in this particular way so it doesn't stretch time uh, out in any particular way. They just say it's an order reversal. Notice there are lots and lots of order reversals. So I, sh I proved it to you with pins. You can write it down mathematically as well. This is an example of, uh, of an order reversing transformation. You take t, and instead of going to negative t, you go to this cubed root, which looks horrible. Uh, but it turns out to be perfectly order reversing. And you can check, it has this funny property which you want reversals to have, that if you apply them twice, you get back to where you started. So if I 
apply this transformation, and then apply it again, it turns out what I get is just T, where I started. It goes back to the identity. Uh, so that's good. Time revers reversals are all like that. I mean, a reversal is the sort of thing that you apply it once by reversing, and then you reverse again, and you go back to where you started. Uh, this order reversal does that. Um, so why isn't that okay from the pancake account? And I think what you want to say, what you should say, is that, uh, well, you don't want to stretch out time. Uh, you know, this isn't acceptable. When I reverse order, I don't want to also do this other stuff. I want to think about what, it, what time, what, what it means to reverse time in a little more detail. And I might make this rough observation. This is a rough fact. It's different from a fake fact. Uh, there's going to be an actual fact soon, okay? But this is a rough fact. The standard order reversal, t goes to negative t, is the only reversal that doesn't stretch time unevenly. Rough fact. Uh, so that's neat. We can just make that a requirement if we want to. Don't stretch time unevenly, and I'm not going to, I'll settle what it means to reverse order. Uh, here's the actual facts, in case you care to see. This is also in those papers that I wrote. Uh, yeah, this one, for example, that's linked to the, to the talk. Uh, you can make a no stretching requirement by requiring that this be a linear transformation. You make sure it's an involution because that's what it means to reverse. You apply it twice and you get back to where you started. And you demand that it reverses order. And there's only one form for such a thing. And it's a one line argument to show this. Uh, it has to be a transformation that looks like this. It sends you to negative t, maybe plus a constant. Um, and for specialists, you don't really have to worry about this constant so much because you're very often going to be working with the time translation invariant theory in which translation by a constant is a symmetry of the theory, so it doesn't matter. You may as well just eliminate it for simplicity. Uh, interesting open question. So in the paper that's linked to this talk, there's a bunch of open questions that people just haven't thought about very much yet, including me. And one is, what if it's a theory that's not uh, time translation invariant? Like relativity theory is rarely time, time translation invariant. Uh, then what? You know, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's, it's going to mean something special to time reverse around one point in time or time reverse around a different point in time. It will just mean different things. Uh, so it looks like there's lots and lots of different uh, distinct uh, definitions of time reversal on such accounts. Also in open systems, the same thing should occur. Uh, but I don't think too many people have talked about that yet. Anyway, but the point is, uh, you have this nice strategy where you can just Think a little bit about what you want time to be like and how things change in time and uh, that you don't want to be stretching for no reason. And with these requirements added, you get uh, a unique way to reverse order. So I think you should say stuff like this. And the standard account can just do that. But the whole point of the pancake objection is you shouldn't be doing illicit things. All that matters is turning around the order of things in time. And now, I would like them to also say, uh, adopt a few reasonable assumptions as well about the nature of time. Uh, and then it's going to break this under determination. You'll have a unique way to reverse order. So, Brian, you've talked for about 50 minutes. OK. Yeah, I'm basically, then I'm basically done. This is the end of the critique. Uh, maybe I'll just go for five minutes to show you the next steps of this, of this literature. Uh, so. My question to them, or anybody, is why not assume a little more about the nature of time? And I think one reason why it's difficult to do that from the pancake perspective is as soon as you start assuming a little more about the nature of time, suddenly you start getting these really good arguments that things like the magnetic field and spin and the quantum fu wave function and all these properties, maybe bravery and cowardly, uh, they change when you change the direction of time. Once you start thinking more about the nature of time, you get all these details that start coming out. Uh, so I'm not so sure that, I, I wouldn't, it's not clear to me why a pancake person would adopt these kinds of assumptions to break the underdetermination and not assume a little bit more. And now two main threads in this literature in which people try to derive the meaning of time reversal from simple, plausible assumptions about the nature of time. Uh, you have Malamon doing this in the context of space-time theories. You have me doing this in the, quantum, in the context of quantum theories. Uh, here's just a really flyby. This is, now, this is the stuff I said at the beginning. I don't want to get into too many technical details in this particular talk. 
more technical details next talk, but we can also discuss this if you guys want to discuss this more. Um, so let me just mention that Malamont thing and my thing, how we tried to argue for the standard definition of time reversal in physics. And really the main conclusion of this literature is that there seem to be some properties that can depend on the direction of time, even though they're not velocities. Whoops, it's not the end yet, sorry. <laughs> uh, so Malamont looks at temporal properties of a field. So this is really, really brief technical interlude. It, to me, this is just dead obvious in a field theory. Suppose I, Malamont has this particular perspective on how you should think about time reversal. We're looking at fields like this magnetic field. That, that's how it looks lying in space. And now I'm going to realize that this is a field that's actually occurring in a space-time. And that space-time has a bunch of light cones in it. And for our purposes in this talk, all you really need to know is that one of these light cones, the, the black part of these light cones, is sort of pointed to the future. So the future is a little weird in general relativity because it's not just a straight line, you know, a straight timeline. The future can be off in this direction, or this direction, or this direction. Uh, and the light cones are only required to change smoothly as you go across this plane. Uh, but we identify one side of the light cones with the direction of time. And that's called a uh, time orientation. Uh, you can do it formally by writing down a vector field, like these red lines are vector fields, and they pick out, they point into one direction of, of the double cone and tells you where the future is. Uh, and then, once you do that, you recognize you have an obvious time reverse, which is to, instead of color this one black, you color the bottom thing black. And now you have the opposite direction of time. So Malamont points out that in space times that admit this sort of thing, a time orientation, uh, you have a really nice way to describe time reversal. And actually, every space time locally admits such a description. If you look at a little region, you can always find such a place. So here's a nice, easy definition of time reversal. And then you can just notice that in a field theory, things are pretty free. You know, I have some structures laying around. I could define a field and use it to represent something that looks like this. This is going to be a constant k times tau, the time orientation. And you could ask, does, do physical fields that are not just velocities turn around in time? And on this definition, it sure looks like yes. If I reverse time by reversing tau, you know, it's, it's such a simple thing. I have negative tau here, and this would go to negative psi over here. Uh, and there's lots of, you know, imagine all the different ways. I, all I need to do is define a field in terms of this tau, and suddenly I'll have a thing that turns around in time when I time reverse it. And what Malamont argues in this little article is that the, some of the central quantities in electromagnetism do that because they depend on temporal orientation once you think carefully about how they're defined. So in looser language, he says, Analyze the way that the time orientation hooks up to the physical quantities, the, the, the fields. Uh, and then that should allow you to in, induce, to figure out what the transformation rules are for time reversal. So he derives that this is the case, and this is the case for these fields. And you find in particular that the electric field doesn't change sign, but the magnetic field does when you do this. There's some other subtleties here. One has to use a spatial orientation and make sure that that reverses appropriately. But so, sort of glossing a lot of this, we can talk about more if you like. Uh, this I wanted to just point out briefly, that, oh, a nice open problem for somebody who cares about this stuff. Uh, there is a robust mathematical theory of quantum fields on space times. Uh, you ought to be able to do the same thing there. Ask what does time reversal mean in quantum theory, where these quantum fields are spread across space time as not classical fields, but quantum fields. And there's a theorem of Vardarjan that I cite uh, the exact thing in the, in the paper for this talk uh, that should lead you towards a path to doing this. But I think this is an open problem if somebody wanted to work on deriving time reversal for QFT uh, using the Malamont strategy. That's the theorem. I will go through it now. Uh, otherwise, if you're not on a space-time theory, there's other ways you can do this. Uh, I have an argument in 2017 about how you can derive things like the fact that position doesn't reverse, but momentum does, spin does. Uh, time reversal conjugates wave functions in quantum theory, so I derive that um, from a couple of simple assumptions. I'm not going to, yeah, I think I'm not going to waste time going through all this now. Uh, but anyway, if you want to follow up on the slides, there's various arguments here for why this is like this. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, 
So this now is the complete lesson I wanted to give you. So we can understand time reversal by exploring how things depend on time. Many properties reverse when time reverses. And denying this has some undesirable consequences. I reviewed with the pancake account. Uh, and moreover, those properties can be derived. Uh, the way they reverse under time reversal can be derived from some reasonable assumptions about how things depend on time. Malamont did it from a space-time perspective. I did it from a sort of uh, dynamical systems perspective in quantum theory. And uh, yeah, that's it. So defense of the standard account. <laughs> Thank you very much. same problem which has just been raised by, by philosophers. Um, because I think we can see clearly if we think from the point of view of someone like, like Morgan, maybe, which would be the, an imitation. It's an imitation. Uh, because you say that there are two, uh, so you said imitating modeling that there is no sense in the same time reversal. Uh, I'm not sure if this meaningless of what it would mean. It seems that there are these two different ideas. One, you have something like a time ordering of, say, instance, and you assign stuff to them. Uh, you're taking events and you're assigning them to instance. Hmm. And you can consider the case in which you, uh, you assign, give a new assignment to the two events to instance. So they were, as you took the pens and you put them like this, then you keep the ordering of this the same, but you know, change the order of the pens. Or you, you assign the same events to the same points, but now what you're doing is reversing time in the sense of changing the direction on the, in the, of the events. And this seems to be two different things. And maybe what time reversal suggests that you are that you are changing the direction of the events. So there was an ordering on the events and you're changing that. And you can say this is not possible unless you think that the ordering is somehow a function of distributed things. But do you think it's an intrinsic fact about time or about, say, the space time manifold that's a causal structure and this is just an intrinsic fact, it doesn't depend on any distributed things? Then you can still claim it doesn't make any sense to you have, or it's not metaphysically possible to reverse time. What you can do is distribute things differently on time. Yeah, so I agree with the last thing about the difference between what you can and can't do. You can't actually reverse time. You can change how things are distributed around. You can create orderings, time orderings. You can't actually reverse time, so that's true. And then there's this proposal you're pointing out to imagine reversal of motion, maybe in some event ordering perspective, uh, as separate from reversing time. Um, and the thought is supposed to be something like, when I reverse motion, it would be, it would, it's more sensible to say that physical properties depend on motion uh, than it is to say that they depend on the direction of time. And just personally, I, I don't have a strong intuition about that. I don't see why a property can't depend on the direction of time. In the same way that a property can depend on the direction of space, property can depend on the direction of time. So I worry in the first instance that what physicists are saying doesn't help me so much understand things like the magnetic field. If they're saying we need to focus on motion reversal, not time reversal, I'm still looking at a magnetic field and although it's an axial vector field, it's, it's not really like water spinning. It's formally analogous to water, water spinning, but it's not a velocity, it's a magnetic field. Uh, so it doesn't help me that much by itself. And then, so on the one hand, I think what they say is too weak. On the other hand, I, want the, I don't see why they don't say something stronger. I'm perfectly happy to say that there are some properties which depend on the direction of time. And however one defines the direction of time, I mean, to me, a time orientation is as good a definition as any of the direction of time. Uh, and, you know, one can use arguments like this to state ways that things, properties do depend on the direction of time, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, I've heard this sort of con no, concern before. That in a sense, it's a matter of language, right? It's just how we use words. No, I think you're, you're perfectly right about what mm. you said. So it's not, not just a change of motion. Uh. Okay. Clearly, 
you must apply in the case of, of distribution of fields and something you cannot all the properties that change cannot are not just just uh, motions and velocities. I mean this is just, just seems incoherent mm. it's pretty convincing. Uh, mm. The point was just there is a distinction between maybe reversing time itself and this uh, reversing the distribution of things. Yes, fair and enough. This is what maybe I think would have said modeling and which I would, wouldn't believe. I don't think you could by changing the distribution, changing change out Ah, fair enough. Uh, yes, yes, that's fair enough. Yeah, I completely agree with that point. Good. Um, sorry, the, the normal physicist asked this question. Um, very healthy. And the, the pancake view is intuitively motivated to swap layers around. And they say that only involves change in velocity. I think in the paper you say more generally experience some change. Right. Yes. But I, I don't understand why they're motivated to limit it. Even if you're a pancake, you want to say surely that anything that depends on how things are in neighboring time slices ought to change. And that catches bravery, right? Because it depends on how things are in the immediate past and future, which not only which direction you're running, but more specifically, what actions are doing, what intentional motive actions. And do you think and you think those amount to a rate of change? No, I don't think they're right. Okay, so good, good. So he's limiting it to rates of change. Anything that depends on or supervenes on ah. the ordering of the time slice. Yes, yes. Well, that's what I'm arguing. Yeah, that, right. so that's exactly what I think so is perfectly question, reasonable. Right, okay. So then we agree. Then my question is, and this is mm. a genuine question because I have no idea, ah. are any of the physical properties you're pointing to or the standard you point to not supervening on the order of the pancakes? Um, well, no, no, really. I mean, when I... So the, the technical accounts that I sort of glossed uh, argue for senses in which, if you think really carefully about what you mean by the ordering of those slices in one mathematical sense or another, uh, then you find that when you turn around time, uh, these properties really do, in their very definition, depend on the direction of time, on the, on the, on, on the direction of the ordering. Because I like the pancake intuition yeah, well, I mean, I guess where, where it goes off the rails, it seems, is when it restricts to rates of change, you know. Yeah, but, uh, but this is a much more reasonable perspective, and I think it's what leads to the standard account, actually, is, is the one you propose. So, yeah, thanks for that. That's a nice way to put it. I should write it in that sense, in terms of super Yeah, there's this paper fiction actually come from a I know, I know, I wonder. <laughs> but, uh, no, 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 it could do, I, I guess. I mean, so one response to a lot of this, I suppose, is to say space time has a preferred, space time is Minkowski <laughs> uh, with a preferred reference frame. And uh, you are a wave, you're not, so I guess some things depend on what you think about the wave function. Um, so let's say you're a wave function anti-realist. So the stuff that really matters is the configuration space, uh, which has positions. <laughs> and the positions change over time. Yeah. And they've got velocities. And there is no momentum, really, that even gets discussed here. You know? And there's no other properties uh, of those. I mean, to sufficiently describe those particles, you know, and their fundamental properties, that's it. I guess, yeah, so maybe there's a Bohmian response to this. It says, just be a Bohmian, and everything's uh, fine. I guess there's a layered question, though, that Bohmians, in order to have all the ordinary descriptions of time reversal, you ought to, you still are going to want to do the normal stuff that everybody does when you uh, apply time reversal. So you want to conjugate the wave function and reverse big P and not reverse big Q in quantum mechanics. And uh, I think they can argue for that, actually. Um, I have, where did I put this? I don't know if this is in a published thing. It might be, I maybe wrote it in a dissertation, I forget. Uh, but if you'd like to see this little argument, there's a short argument you can give in Bohmian Mechanics, uh, which follows a similar strategy to the one I do in the 2017 paper. You basically assume some reasonable stuff about time, and you derive that the wave function ought to conjugate, and the P reverses, and stuff like that. Uh, I wonder, yeah, so there's maybe some open work to do there, because I wonder if that would have implications for the Bohmian ontology. It's a subtle, subtle thing, you know, like the exact role that the wave function plays. There's a big literature about the different moves there. Uh, but I, yeah, I wonder if you could make progress even in that literature thinking in this sort of way. That's sort of an interesting question. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, there's lots of I open stuff. Follow up right on that. So is this, I haven't read uh, Alori's recent article. 
Mm -hmm. Is that what she has in mind? That if you have this understanding kind of time reversal, you you change the ontology? What does she mean by that? Uh, it's more like um, uh, you should only you should only as I as, as I understand it. So I, I should read the paper more carefully. But as I understand it, uh, the basic move in this part of the paper is uh, I don't need to I don't need to conjugate the wave function because it's not real. I'm only going to worry about transforming things that really matter. And so she's not responding to uh, I wrote her actually and asked if she'd had a look at this response. This paper had existed but I think she hadn't seen it yet because it's still forthcoming and so I sent her that paper and she said SH, the, the studies paper is already in print. So she's not responding to a lot of the stuff that I've just set out here. Um, I don't know if she's thought about whether it's a serious thing that this definition of time reversal she's got does weirdo stuff when you go to actually use it, you know? But if we don't do something to a known thing because we think it doesn't exist, uh -huh. that doesn't mean we change the ontology by time reversal. Yeah, this is, it's hard for me to speculate about. I'm not really sure what Valley would say in this context. Sorry, yeah. Do you have another one? Uh, not, not on, on what Alori meant no, no, no. changing ontology. Yes. So, so as I said before, uh, I think you are 100 percent correct on, on substance, but I have a question on, on form. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe it's unfair since I'm an informal talk, but I'm not really sure I understand what you mean by changing t to minus t. Uh, you're changing that into what? Uh, so what, what are we doing? Uh, you want to define the notion of time reversal. So the time reversal of what uh, is what? Good. Yeah, yeah. So there, really, there's two perspectives on how to reverse time. There is the Malamont one, in which you're looking at a time orientation. You do that specifically because there's not a preferred foliation of space-time in general. You know, There's just lots of different ways to do it. And so there's not one timeline that is the okay. timeline, right? So, But in dynamical systems, there is. In dynamical systems like in Hamiltonian mechanics or quantum mechanics, in any theory in which you have a state space and some sort of unitary evolution rule, either like symplectic Hamiltonian mechanics or, or unitary quantum theory, uh, you have a little t parameter, you know? And maybe, you know, you have a, a bunch of them for each foliation or something like that. Uh, you sometimes do that in QFT. Uh, but you have a unitary parameter. So when I talk about reversing little t, I'm always thinking in terms of dynamical systems. Yeah, but so, so the idea is we have, in general, we have some sort of mathematical model or something which is a model of a given theory. Uh, and we operate on that. We, we define the time reversal of that model as another model. So Correct. Another Correct. So one way to understand time reversal is that you take the model set S for a dynamical systems theory, and you're going to transform it. And what it means for the theory to have time reversal symmetry is for the, when this transformation is time reversal, is that it preserves the model set. It takes each possible model into another possible model. Yeah. And, uh, follow up on this because mm -hmm. so, so so this you, you this works with changing t to minus t when you have, as you said, uh, a dynamic system. Uh, it's more complicated and management than some proposal of you have to build with a space time. Uh, stuff defined on it. Uh, so my, my question was, so if we work with a model which is as detailed as possible, the one which is, uh, so a model of a space-time, maybe um, one which is described without coordinates and so on, uh, a model of, of a physical theory. Shouldn't it be the case that if we apply the transformation Right, and we change, so we move things around like this, the distribution of, of stuff into the, into the manifold. Automatically, I mean, if we do this and we change the position, everything which is defined in terms of position, like velocity, but also momentum, also, uh, or maybe all the proper dependent field, will automatically you know, change. We don't need to specify any change in the mathematical structure. Uh, maybe. I think there's an open question with that in really, really general field theories. So I've got a bunch of stuff on there that I'm defining, you know, I've got electromagnetic fields. So in effect, sorry, so let me, but let me also just clarify. So the second part of your question now has moved away from the little t discussion. You're just asking about field theories defined on space times. 
So, so I'm, not, I'm not asking about little little time parameter now, right? I would be free to use this approach to time reversal, or yeah, did you have? Just, just, I think my main thought is just that, uh -huh. I mean, at least in reality, uh, I think since that uh, the velocity depends on position, supervenes on position, you cannot change the position of things, you cannot change the velocity. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. doesn't, you cannot have a possible world in which the, the position has been changed, but the velocity remains the same. So the, why? It is consistent, maybe because in a mathematical structure like a phase space, you could you could do that, but it doesn't mean anything. But you could not uh, have a possible world which is exactly like this in terms of position, but which differs in velocity, because velocity supervenes the position. So uh -huh. The question is, if we had a theory, a completely detailed theory, and we had something like a model of the theory in which you have velocity which is defined in terms of position. You could not change statements, which statement were true in terms of velocity uh, or position and, and have different outcomes for, uh, for momentum and velocity. Uh -huh. You see what my... Yes, yes. And, but is, so is then part of the question, uh, besides velocity, what other properties have that uh, character that... I mean, you point out correctly that you could, in principle, just change the meaning, you know, change around the Q's and P's however you want to and reverse the time order, that will be sure to change velocities automatically and it won't reverse all these other properties necessarily. No, my point is to the contrary, that they, they would. I mean, not if we have uh, uh, something like a dynamical system in which you, you can specify these things independently, but if we had something which depicts reality better, so if we had a uh, first order theory where reality works and we had a model of that, and then we perform something on this you know, yeah, well, not, so it's, it's interesting. Change position without changing. Yeah, know, yeah, so. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the devil's in the details, really. What, what I found looking at dynamical systems in general is that they're so, so abstract that it's hard to say how things transform under time reversal without adding some meaning. Because Q, state of the world, QP coordinates, they're canonical conjugates, but like no other information at all. I don't even know that P represents momentum and Q represents position. It could be the reverse, you know, that's, that's, that's under the Legendre transformation. So, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know that just looking at a dynamical system, everything automatically transforms the way it ought no, to. No, it doesn't, that is the point. The dynamical system, not the good representation. For good. Because you could, but I good. independently, but reality. You know, good. So then the point of the 2017 paper, uh, linked in this talk a little bit, is that with some very, very mild assumptions about dynamical systems, you can restore the basic facts about time reversal. And I do it in layers. You can do it in a few stages. By assuming a little bit more, so this is the 2017 paper called Three Myths About Time Reversal in Quantum Theory. Uh, it doesn't just apply to quantum theory, really. It quite quickly generalizes to Hamiltonian physics. Uh, but it's because it's the same arguments. We have a forthcoming paper about that, actually, just doing it for some flexing mechanics. Uh, but the basic sorts of things you do are you say things like, okay, here's a first assumption. Uh, suppose that I've got um, two states which are mutually inconsistent. They can't both happen at the same time. So in quantum theory, uh, that means that they're orthogonal states their inner product is zero. Uh, and suppose that whatever time reversal means, it, it preserves this impossibility result. So what that's saying is whether or not two things are mutually impossible together or mutually possible together, that doesn't depend on the direction of time. So it's a substantial assumption. It means something, right? You're like bringing something on board. But it has big consequences, and from that Assumption alone, uh, of ray space orthogonality, you can prove that any transformation that, that has this property is either unitary or anti unitary. So you get this is a generalization of Wigner's theorem, and you get this really particular transformation now that's, that's available to you by making this tiny little restriction. And so I show some ways to make some other tiny little restrictions that seem really intuitively plausible, and you can get all the way to things like transforming Q and P in the appropriate way. Uh, and finding that in dynamical systems is a so-called anti-symplectic transformation or anti-unitary transformation. You can get a bunch of stuff out of this, just assuming really, really small things. They're not for free, you know? I mean, 
it, what you say is quite correct. Dynamical systems are so, so abstract that it's hard to pick up the way that the direction of time changes properties. But give yourself just a little moving room. Probably there's lots of ways to do this. I just figured out one, you know, in this paper. Uh, but give yourself a little assumption that you can, you can say a lot about what time reversal means. Okay. I <coughs> am a little bit worried about the apparent sort of uh, resurgence of the whole pancake movement. <laughs> uh, I, so I share many of the worries you have about their approach, but not all of them. As, as I see it, um, the concerns, you, you list four concerns, mm. they're, the degree to which they're concerning or disconcerting uh, are, is very, very different. Mm. The first one is just the motivation. That may be misguided, but you know we could have a philosophical debate about this. Uh, what exactly we were supposed to be doing? So that's. I, I I think I would side with you, but that's not so decisive. Mm. The second one I think is a really deep problem that cannot be pushed to the side so quickly about the momentum not changing. Mm. If you change the the velocity, so I'd be interested to hear how they think. You mentioned that they're in personal conversation. Somebody at least has said this is not so bad. Yeah, I, 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 would, I just don't want to mention them by name. We can talk afterwards, but you know. Uh, that's fine, that's fine. But so so I'm, I, I think that's a much stronger, much more problematic aspect of their approach. The third one, I think, is absolutely fatal. They don't survive that. Um, if, if, because what we're in the business of doing is we're in the business of understanding that S. Mm. This is what we're really trying to do. We want to understand the structure of that S for a theory. So uh, uh, one obvious way to do that is to sort of look at different kinds of transformations that leave the structure of the S invariant and stuff like this. So this, if, if you just don't let me do that uh, by insisting on some sort of trivial things, uh, I'm not going to be able to, to probe that at all. Mm. So I think that's just sufficient reason itself to say, well, you may want to call this that. If it's just about words, I'm not interested. But if it's something more than that, then I think you're really missing a lot of the things you could do. Mm -hmm. And the final point, the fourth, however, I think is you being very uncharitable, I find. Ah, okay. Because it seems to me that in their spirit of the of swapping around the pancake ordering or the, the, the pen ordering or what have you, mm -hmm. you could say, well, and we mean to leave invariant the other sort of metrical aspects of, you know, the, the sort of the, the things that you then list and as, as would be our sort of, you know, our presumably come for free on the standard account. You could help yourself to, to, to these sort of metrical relations as well without saying that you want to change the intrinsic states at the time. Why? Why do they, uh, let's see what, where that comes from, from in that case. At least, I don't know. So you're saying, yeah, OK, there's a modified view. Well, because pancake have a invariant thickness, even if they flipped around. <laughs> <laughs> to speak in the metaphor. I mean, it's an additional assumption. It's true, but it seems to make sense. Uh, it seems reasonable, and it doesn't go against what I take to be their central motivation is, namely not to change the intrinsic instantaneous state. Hmm. That would be consistent with that, and that would remove the underdetermination. So I'm not really so concerned about four, I suppose. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, I guess I got thinking about that, especially uh, in this literature on time observables, which is different literature. Uh, confusingly also uses this big T symbol to represent an observable. Uh, and the quick background is although people thought for a long time in quantum mechanics you can't have time reversals, they just had too restrictive a, de of a definition of observable. And there's lots of time observables people have developed in this theory now. And they describe things like clocks, you know. Uh, and then when, and when you're in the business of defining, so you can ask this question, what does time reversal mean? You can ask, what is a time observable? What's its definition? And you're asking something about how are we going to define what counts as a clock. And I thought, I don't know, I'm just very liberal about this sort of stuff. So I feel a little very happy with all kinds of different clocks. Uh, there is a common restriction where people say clocks ought to tick at the same rate in every moment. 
But I imagine, you know, I've got a, a, the analog of an hourglass clock with sand coming down it, but I've got different liquids in there, you know, that are different masses. And the liquid, you know, oil and water or something like that, and various other things. And the rate at which they pass through this, this hourglass changes depending on what moment it is in the clock. And if an entire society developed that clock, it would be perfectly consistent with describing reality. I don't have any problem with describing clocks that way. It's just a little weird to us, because all our clocks tick at the same rate. But somebody, you could even argue, like, maybe it's really nice if, if people like to work really hard in the morning, that they have t clocks, uh, you know, tick more quickly in the morning and more slowly in the afternoon or something like that, you know? So you have, like, more hours in the morning to fit in all these different little scheduled appointments or something like that. Uh, but the, you know, it's the same world that's being described as so you've changed your clocks to be a little weird. So you can do that, and there's formal ways of discussing all this sure, stuff. Sure. So, and then I just thought, I mean, actually that sort of thing comes down to what you think about the nature of clocks, you know. Uh, what counts as a clock? It's a sort of a physical thing. And so whether or not I, when I'm manipulating time and transforming time, I stretch things out or don't stretch things out, that also depends on how I think about what sorts of things there are in time. And I don't have any problem really with stretching time, uh, except, I don't know, I just like to put on, on the table what it is that I'm assuming. Uh, but my impression about this account is that you're not supposed to say stuff about what's sitting inside space and time. You're not supposed to have any thoughts about the, the, whether it's a magnetic field or electric field or a particle of field or anything like that. You could say you do the same thing. You transform T to minus T. But that's not changing things in time or thinking about things in time. That's just thinking about teeth. Yeah. Yeah, but, so, but I guess, yeah, again, my question is, you know, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Maybe it's, it's a bit more than the purist might want, but it seems a reasonable thing to take on board. It would solve that concern, and I think it would preserve, and this is important, what I take to be the spirit of the pancakers, namely that they don't want to change around the intrinsic uh, states of the intrin intrinsic yeah. properties of instantaneous states. Uh, uh. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe it is so a stronger account that, that works fine. Yeah. Yes, right. Well, I'll leave it to the end because I don't want to waste any time with questions. So here we go. Uh, I was thinking also about the thickness of these pancakes. Are they American or are they crepes? And, uh, <laughs> if, they're, if they're infinitely thin, then you have uh, a kind of like version of Zeno's arrow paradox, sort of. These things don't really have velocities uh, in some sense. They have a mathematical, mathematically defined uh, uh, instantaneous velocity, but not real velocities. And I was thinking, uh, how do we understand time reversal? Well, maybe the answer is just you don't. It's just like a, it's a fun, interesting mathematical thing, but not a real metaphysical thing. And if you try to really understand it metaphysically, you're going to end up driving yourself insane. And uh, cowardice and bravery, flipping over and stuff, and like, would we have free will, and would we remember the past, uh, remember the future instead? And like, maybe that's not the way to go. I, mean, I, I don't know anything about this. Maybe when you said, this matters, uh, is the thing that matters the fully metaphysically interpreted thing, or is it just the mathematical thing? Because if it's only the mathematical thing, maybe we can stop there. Well, I bet you could do, you know, you can do, have a lot of these discussions with thick pancakes, but I mean, I also just feel so strongly opinionated about the infinitely thin pancakes that I have to come from this, this discussion. I mean, I know there's a literature about where velocity lives, you know, and can it really live at an instant, and there's you know, endless discussions about this stuff. But to me, uh, what we're doing with mathematics is representing properties of the world, and then I'm making predictions about things. And it's true that in my humanness, I can only accurately measure thick chunks of space and thick chunks of time. But that doesn't prevent me from representing you know, the idea of a moment in time. And most of this literature is okay with that. I can talk about the idea of a spatial slice, a moment in time. And if I can do that, I just recognize what I'm doing is like an applied mathematician. I can take properties and assign them to points. And on some perspectives of velocity, you're quite right. You think of velocity as change in position over time. And so if there's no position changing, or there's infinitely you know, small positions changing, uh, then you know, there's not really any velocity at a point, is the perspective. But I have a different perspective on what velocity is. It's just like a little more abstract. I just think you can assign mathematical structures 
to moments in time, literal moments in time, which perfectly capture the concept of velocity in an instant. And what we normally do is, so this is now a space-time, uh, and, or, there's different ways to do this, but, so I've got a space-time, and this is a, an event, like, one's first kiss in Paris, or something like that. So it happened at a place at a time, right, right there. And it's an infinitely small point thing, and it's okay to use that, we agree. Uh, but now I'm going to assign to this point a much more elaborate mathematical structure, which is called the tangent space, which is itself a manifold, and it's a vector space, and it's got all these vectors on it. So I assigned not just one, but a whole bunch of things to this, so just a big vector space. And it's not really living in space-time. It is living in the tangent plane, but I just took this entire gigantic mathematical structure, which is itself you know, a particular manifold with a symplectic form that sits on it and lets me do all kinds of interesting physics and talk about velocities and their magnitudes and all this stuff. And I just assigned it to this point. I said, this structure represents for me the possible velocities at this point, and I can pick this thing out. And it's true, it doesn't live in this little distance of space or any distance of space on this manifold. It exists at this point as I've just now decided to represent it. So I'm just quite free with how I use mathematics to represent the world. And, and I just, I don't find this literature compelling because I, I feel inclined to use more rich mathematical structures to represent reality. And then this is the sort of context I'm working in actually all, you know, on Malamont's approach, all these, this vector field, this thing, they live in the tangent spaces of this manifold. So you're sort of implicitly already using this, this uh, uh, apparatus when you're, when you're talking about velocity in the, in the field theoretic sense. Yeah, so I'm not, not taking a side on this at all, but I, I think maybe maybe your response about bravery, which I maybe understand a little bit better, would be that uh, at the infinitesimal you know level, at the smallest, thinnest uh, time slice, if there's no change, and if bravery is a thing that has change into it, then you don't have bravery. And this is only important for things that have change. Um, maybe that would be the, the reply. This is the super pancake theory, where there's no velocity, there's no anything as long as there's no change. I mean, what's funny is, you know, there is this funny degenerate case. I can t mathematically, I can do this. I can remove all the events in space-time. You know, you want to think that it's all of space and all of time, but in some weird possible worlds, there's just one event that happens, and it's really brief, you know, the, the universe. Uh, so it just has one point. And it's sort of a degenerate thing, but I can assign to that a tangent space. I can talk about vectors even at that one point. So, and what do I use the vectors to represent? I mean, maybe one represents bravery and the other one cowardice and then everything in between, you know. I sort of have the opportunity to, the strength of your bravery and the strength of your coward, uh, cowardice. And it can be arbitrarily large, you know, your bravery and your cowardice. Uh, yeah, so, but it's, it's such an interesting discussion. I mean, uh, there's some, yeah, qu questions I don't know the answers to about how one, what one means by bravery and cowardice and, and the mathematics. So, thanks for the, the comment, that was nice. Uh, yeah, I wanted to follow on your objection. Okay. Three, which is just to say, if, and now being a pancake, I'm thinking that the pancake, the, the super idea like doesn't just collapse. Into it. But can I say, um, you can have your transformation. Right? You just don't get to call it time reversal. But what, what my transformation, apart from the question of what gets called time reversal, my question is interesting. If you're interested in you know, finding an arrow of time in a big theory. Are there any, yeah, is physics symmetric in that sense? No, not at all, except in the most trivial cases. There's my arrow of time, thank you. Now you go do yeah, <laughs> do a bad you know, position. Like that. Okay. So I think there may be some scope for tolerance. That's my is that a question to me, or do you want to write it to me? I thought you were being unfair. So unfair to Brian's concern, then. No, too generous to ask, so I'm going to the pancakes. Oh, but I was arguing that they should be discharged of the four... No, three sorry, not three. The no, 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 three. Temporal symmetries. Okay, so they want to... I see. So what they have in mind is not so much an appreciation of the structure of physical theories or anything like that. They, they really, they're really metaphysicians, they're not philosophers of physics. And they think there is this thing that is time that can be flipped around and it, can, it means a certain particular thing to do that. And if you do it the right way, 
and whatever we, you know, we're interested in what we're doing has nothing to do with our university. Yeah, I don't want to lean too hard on that, but okay. it seems like something you'd say in response to your claim that concern number three is mm -hmm. that's a line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a very. The, Part three really is a sensitivity to science concern. That's right. It's, uh, it's something like uh, we use these theories to do stuff. It would be nice to have a useful theory rather than a useless theory. Uh, yeah. I mean, actually, that's. But, but I, I think I see what, what the idea is. And, and that's true. So I mean, there is a conceivable defense that draws more on, on metaphysical intuitions. And that's somehow to try to get at the, at the true nature of time that, uh, you know, Brian and I are missing and we're, we're, we're you know, uh, uh, studying these richer, or, you know, all the things that really are missing when they're studying the much richer transformations. Um, okay. But I think that would require further argument, not just because the, the thing is, one general concern I have with that sort of strategy is that here, you know, we get to mathematical or even highly mathematical contexts where it's just not so obvious. I mean, this is coming back to a point that was made earlier, really. It's not so obvious how that connects to, to these metaphysical intuitions anyway. Sure. I'd like to think that just to see that. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. From my perspective, it's, I don't have strong intuitions about what like a magnetic field does outside of the context of physics. And so it sits in this structure already where I'm, you know, it has all this background about how we learned about it and you know, there's just some philosophy that goes into understanding what a magnetic field is already. Uh, so I find it very hard to step out of that and now say there is this more abstract metaphysical thing that is a magnetic field which is now sort of dropping uh, other things that one learned in physics, uh, and just imagining it as a thing that lies there in, in space. You know, one can do that, I think, you know, all that is, it is a transformation. You know, I think that, I take that to be one of your points. It is a perfectly well-defined transformation. Uh, but it's, uh, because I don't know what magnetic field means, I don't see how, from that perspective, it's so easy to say how a magnetic field transforms. In philosophy physics context, it's much clearer for me to know what magnetic field means, and so I can say how it transforms, because it connects to time in this and that way, and so on. Um, I don't know if this is, this is helpful at all, but you know, uh, have you heard of Fabrice Correa's new book on uh, the growing block theory? Uh, yes. He's hit his part in it, and I think the basic idea is uh, use a tense logic to define the future and the past. So, uh, stuff that happened in the past is true, stuff that happened in the future may be true, and when it becomes true, then it's true forever. Uh, but it's basically you define past and future just in terms of what you can say is true or not. And then, if you define predicates as sort of like the typical metaphysical sense, uh, that don't change on the long possible world, sort of like a strong thing, maybe this can help, so you say, here's the set of all things that are brave, or here's the set of all possible worlds where this is, you know, bravery, this is how it is. Then when you switch time, the thing that was brave before is no longer brave now. Um, so that would favor your view uh, for any of these properties that could be, uh, you know, like held constant over all possible worlds. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's so neat. Uh, I'll have to look more carefully yeah. at the logic. Interesting. It sort of it sort of defeats the the the, the, the view that I forget what her name was the, the new paper says you can't just have this thing change the content of the world. You say well you don't change the content of the world maybe but you change the truth value of claims or something about the mm. future. Mm. Um, it's kind of a neat escape. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Is it you know, or just a past a past future? There's this weird borderline and I think. Uh, they have, they have some way of dealing with it in the appendix, I don't know what it's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we have to come to a conclusion, so please join me in thanking Brian once again. Yeah,